trading at discounts, for us is the idea that active shareholder engagement is a key requisite to uh, unlocking, unlocking value. And today I'd like to focus on two areas of exposure for us, uh, closed end funds and Japan, and to discuss uh, our approach to shareholder engagement in these two areas. So when I talk about AVI's approach uh, to shareholder engagement, there are uh, a number of key characteristics of that. The first is um, we are patient when we make uh, those investments and when we engage in dialogue with um, management of the companies we're invested in. And behind that really is the belief that the underlying assets we're investing in are themselves undervalued and attractive and likely to appreciate. And that buys us time. It's never enough just to buy something on a discount because if you do that, the clock is ticking and it forces you to be aggressive and that is never a good position to be in. So we want to have a constructive dialogue and in all cases, we prefer to have private dialogue away from the scrutiny of the public eye, because that, again, that encourages um, a mutual respect and increases the likelihood of a positive outcome. And research is really paramount here. A, a lot of the companies we're investing in do not have much in the way of sell side research. And where they do, uh, the focus isn't always um, on the most important facts. So we need to do our own research. We need to be confident in our um, investment thesis. And that allows us to have conviction uh, in our investments uh, that we make. It can take a long time uh, to, to have success in engagement. In the case of Tokyo Broadcasting, a Japanese investment, uh, we've now been engaging with the management uh, for three years and we've started to see uh, earlier this year some positive first steps but these are first steps we haven't uh, reached the end game yet and we continue uh, to engage and and what's really helped us achieve those positive first steps has been that uh, positive that, that constructive long-term agenda that we've we've tried to convey to management of the company that has allowed them to build up some trust uh, and respect with us and in some situations we get lucky and we get a result in a much uh, faster uh, period of time in the case of Eurocastle an investment trust we invested in uh, in March 2019 we were able to crystallize um, our, our investment and, and catalyze uh, the situation within a period of nine and a half months so sometimes uh, you get luckier and it goes quicker but in all cases um, being confident about the underlying assets really has allowed us to have that patience so if we turn to japan now and we think about why japan is interesting to people like us why it's interesting to activists in, in general there are key there are, there are two key uh, elements here on the right hand side, you see some valuation metrics for Japan relative to the rest of the world. And Japan, as defined by the MSCI Japan small cap here, stands out on valuation metrics such as enterprise value to EBIT. It stacks up respectably on dividend yield basis. And when you look at the strength of balance sheets, it really does start to stand out. So Japan is interesting on valuation grounds. And within the broader Japan market, uh, what we focused on is a universe that is even more remarkably undervalued. And that is both in our AVI Japan Trust and within uh, our Japanese investments in AVI Global. We have a universe of companies that is trading on remarkably low enterprise value uh, to EBIT multiples, and that has got um, masses of, um, of cash on the balance sheet. And so Japan stands out on valuation grounds. On the left hand side, we describe uh, some of the regulatory changes, some of the corporate governance changes that have been implemented in Japan, notably the corporate governance code and the stewardship code that were introduced in 2014 and 2015. And taken together, 
what you have is cheap valuations together with um, a regulatory environment that is more welcoming to shareholder engagement. And that is really what has encouraged shareholder activists uh, to target Japan and to really to focus on it. So what do you need uh, to invest in Japan? Um, really the key, the primary thing that you need in Japan is patience. Everything takes longer in Japan than you anticipate. And that certainly has been uh, the case. But, but the thing to remember is that despite what may appear to be slow progress, Japan is changing. Um, Japan is remarkably cheap. It's a remarkably inefficient market. And we have the ability to submit shareholder proposals with just 1% ownership in Japan, which is very attractive. And so we have a chance to, to have our voice heard with a fairly low uh, representation on the register. But you also need to um, focus on a variety of issues. It's not enough just to focus on the balance sheet and ask for the cash back because you won't get it back. You need to focus on a variety of corporate governance issues and operational and strategic uh, issues as well. And that's what allows you to build that positive, constructive relationship with management in Japan that will build up trust and encourage them to adopt some of the measures that um, we want to see adopted. So in Japan, we have a variety of uh, different engagement options available to us. We always start um, with face-to-face -face discuss discussions and we always start with the least public uh, approach. We encourage companies to adopt higher standards of capital allocation, more efficient standards of capital allocation, to improve corporate governance, to appoint more independent directors. And uh, it's quite an arduous process of communication by letter, by meeting, by face to face. And only after a period of time, if we feel that we're not getting anywhere, uh, do we resort to more public uh, presentations and ultimately uh, shareholder, present, shareholder proposals and potentially at some stage the calling of EGMs and, and making takeover bids. But there's a whole range and the timeline can be quite, um, can be quite extended. What's really important to recognize in Japan despite what may be perceived as slow progress is that the environment and the attitudes to shareholder engagement are changing for the better quite dramatically. And what's really important to note is the change in attitude from domestic institutional investors, because they hold the key here. And what you see on the right hand side here is a steady and more recently quite dramatic increase in the level of support for shareholder proposals from domestic investors. And the attitude of many domestic companies in Japan is that foreigners will make a noise and you have to try and um, keep them happy. But ultimately, uh, provided or as long as the domestic institutions leave us alone, then we can carry on with our old ways. But now that the domestic institutions are starting to really stand up and try to make the same kind of arguments that we are, now you're really starting to see a, a shift in attitude from management and, and, and a reflection really of that is that they know they can't continue uh, with their old ways uh, forever. Now all of this um, is encouraging investors such as ourselves who are focused on the small cap end of, of the arena but it's also important um, that there are seen to be more high profile successes and what's notable is that in the last 12 to 18 months, we've seen a steady increase in the presence and the activities of high profile activists such as um, Third Point and Elliott, targeting more well known companies in Japan such as SoftBank uh, and, and Sony. And it's important to, to, to see those um, campaigns succeed uh, because there is a trickle down effect that, that occurs in Japan and the small companies and management of the small companies tend to look to their larger counterparts uh, to, to see a, a change in the, in the environment and change in attitudes. 
So um, that's very, very encouraging. And um, they also highlight a shift in, in, in approach um, compared to 10 years ago when uh, activists last targeted Japan uh, in, in a big way. The approach today is much more sympathetic to their cultures. It's much more conciliatory and it's much more um, constructive. And certainly, as far as AVI goes, uh, there's been an evolution in our approach to shareholder activism too. Earlier this year, uh, we, we launched a campaign uh, at an elevator business called Fujitech, which is our largest uh, position within AJOT and a, a major part of AGT as well. And rather than focus simply on the, on the balance sheet and the inefficiency that arises from substantial cash that exists on the balance sheet, we highlighted a number of different operational and strategic inefficiencies that we believe give rise to uh, the, the structural undervaluation alongside um, the balance sheet issues and other governance uh, problems that the company faces. And the objective here in not um, submitting a proposal, but by releasing this public campaign was to encourage increased dialogue between shareholders and between shareholders and the company. And in particular, to provide the information about a company that doesn't have any sell side research to domestic institutions about how undervalued uh, this company is and to encourage them to make their voice heard and to um, make their points known to, to management. And the fact that we are focused on quite long-term issues, operational and strategic issues that can't be remedied overnight, gives them comfort because it, it, it suggests that AVI is not um, there for, to make a quick buck. It's there to really improve uh, shareholder value for all shareholders and for Japan generally. And that's what really encourages them to um, support us, to take our side and to make their points known to management. As I've said before, um, in most cases, our preference is to build a constructive relationship behind the scenes. And we've seen um, on numerous occasions that this, this really works. Earlier this year, we submitted a proposal, three, uh, se several proposals uh, to a company in Japan. And they asked us not to go public on those proposals, but to hold back until they had a chance to um, discuss those proposals at a board meeting. And we agreed to give them uh, time before we went public and said that if we were happy with the outcome of that board meeting, we would withdraw our proposals. Now in Japan, there's a lack of trust between um, incumbent management and foreigners in particular. And in this particular case, um, we, we met with the company after the board meeting. They told us that they were adopting in effect, all the proposals that we suggested. And we immediately said, uh, that's great. And we were withdrawing our uh, proposals. And they were childishly relieved, I would say. They were very happy. And that has now um, engendered a very warm relationship. They trust us. We kept our word. Um, they've done what we've asked them to do. And they've seen a positive response in their share price to that. And going forward now, we're in a position to make further suggestions, further recommendations in a, in a sort of warm, more conducive environment than the hostile ones uh, that sometimes activists face. So if we think about um, our approach to closed end funds, there are some similarities. We um, are looking to invest in situations where we like the underlying value, typically the un value of the assets typically. We're looking um, to invest in situations where we see an opportunity for AVI to, to, to take the lead in engagement with management in order to benefit all shareholders. And again, we have a strong preference for private engagement. If you come in, uh, in an aggressive manner and you push the board or management up against a brick wall, they'll fight to defend, defend themselves. But if you come in um, and you say you like what they're doing, you like their assets, you think they're cheap, 
you share their, their views on that. But there are things that need to be done in order to improve the rating and unlock some of that value, then you're in a much stronger position. So typically, um, we'll invest in situations where we feel we can add something, we can bring something to the table. And there are two typical situations uh, for us in investing in closed end funds. Firstly, where we see a future for the fund. We think um, it's doing good things, but it could do more in order to help uh, narrow the discount, for example. And the second is where um, a fund is, say, too small, it shouldn't really exist, and the structure is not right, where we can be a little bit more aggressive and seek to um, open-end the fund or wind up the fund and seek to eliminate the discount in its entirety. But key in all situations, clearly, we need to have um, a wide discount. We need to be able to have a large percentage stake ourselves that gives us a seat at the table. We need to have a register that's um, singing from the same hymn sheet as us. And um, there should be a variety of different approaches, different angles for us to pursue in our uh, dialogue, in our dialogue with management. I mentioned earlier uh, the example of Eurocastle, which we uh, were involved in last year. This was entirely um, behind the scenes and it led ultimately to a wind up of the fund and distribution of the assets. But for us, the starting point was, first of all, the ability to buy a very, a very substantial stake that got us a seat at the table, but also a sense that we felt the, the assets uh, were substantially undervalued. Uh, here the assets were focused on Italy. There was a portfolio of non-performing loans, which obviously scared uh, some investors. But the key asset really was a company called Doe Value, a listed company that um, services, um, services non-performing loans, and which is a much more stable business, which we felt was uh, tremendously undervalued. We had a register here uh, with shareholders owning um, almost 50% in addition to our state, over 40%, sorry, uh, that wanted the same outcome as us. And ultimately, we were able to prevail over management there to um, wind up the fund, return some cash to us, distribute some assets to us, which led to a very um, attractive return profile in a fairly short period of time. So in summary, um, what I would say is that across our universe, despite the rally that we've seen since the market lows in March, valuations remain extremely compelling. Discounts across our universe are very much towards the wider end of their historic range, although they've come in from the very extreme levels uh, that we saw in March. In many cases, shareholder engagement is key to unlocking the value trapped in that discounts. There are plenty of opportunities uh, that we're involved in in Japan currently, and we're engaging uh, within our uh, closed end fund portfolio in the vast majority of our closed end fund investments that we have currently. All of that is going on behind the scenes. In Japan, corporate governance and shareholder activism remain on the agenda, albeit they may have been delayed somewhat by uh, COVID-19. And importantly in Japan, um, companies are becoming more open and more receptive uh, to shareholder engagement, which gives us a fantastic opportunity uh, to build on the efforts that we've made over the last two or three years to build uh, those relationships. And um, that is really why we have the dedicated fund in Japan, uh, AVI Japan, but it's also why within AVI Global Trust, Japan makes up such a big proportion of, of the portfolio. So thank you very much. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. So Joe, I'm just gonna read off um, one of the questions that was typed in on the Q&A is, what has okay. been the response from Fujitech to your public presentation? Can you say that again? What has been the response from Fujitech to your public presentation? Okay, so um, 
Fujitech have not made a public response yet to our presentation, but we've had a series of uh, dialogues with them, and that's with both senior management and with um, independent non-executive directors as well. So they are taking us very seriously, and uh, the, the dialogue continues. It's probably also worth mentioning that um, we have uh, appointed a colleague to work for AVI in Japan and his being available in Japan to have those meetings at a time when we're unable to travel has been hugely beneficial to us and allows that dialogue, that face-to-face -face dialogue uh, to be able to continue whilst, whilst we're not there. So we expect to have some kind of response from them within the next two or three months. And our aim really is to uh, continue the dialogue until the next AGM when uh, we'll be able to measure whether they how seriously they've taken us and whether we need to take any more aggressive steps in order to um, in order to take this further but in the meantime the encouraging thing is that the share price of future tech has been pretty strong it's still a very cheap undervalued company relative to international peers but there has been increased interest from both domestic and institutional investors and um, that could well be as a result of the case that we've highlighted in our research. Great. Um, also, are there any other parts of your portfolio where you are an activist? Well, as I said at the start, um, there are three uh, aspects to AVI Global Trust, uh, Japan, closed end funds and family controlled holding companies. So um, in the case of Japan and closed end funds, as I've described, we are uh, trying to be an activist engaged shareholder. In the case of the family controlled holding companies, um, active ownership is key, but ultimately AVI can never be in the driving seat because these are controlled by families. But in those cases, we look to the families themselves to be active owners, not necessarily activists, but active owners in the portfolios that they run. And we shy away from situations where families are just passive holders of their assets forever. So again, we're not the activist, but active ownership runs through uh, that part of the strategy. If anybody would like to ask a question, you should be able to unmute yourself actually and also ask questions verbally. Is um, activism a new approach for ABI? It seems you've evolved the strategy to try and create catalysts yourself. I wouldn't say it's an entirely new um, approach, but I think we've emphasized it to a greater extent uh, in the last three or four years. Uh, you know, I think the idea of investing in, in closed end funds historically has resulted in some uh, activism within a British empire as it was then known. Um, and certainly the approach in Japan and the activism there is a new approach that we started about three years ago. But it's um, an evolution, I would say, rather than something radically new. Just to follow up on Fujitech proposal, the focus goes beyond just cash on the balance sheet. But that surplus cash being returned as dividends or share buybacks is still the end game. Can you comment more on how badly that has been set back by the coronavirus pandemic? Yeah, you know, I think when we invested companies trading with, with lots of cash on the balance sheet, um, it's often unrealistic to expect all that cash to come back in, in, in one instance. And uh, the approach really that we've taken is, first of all, to encourage companies to demonstrate to shareholders that they won't allow cash to build up blindly forever. So if they take a step by step approach to using some of that cash to buy back shares and preventing the buildup, that's a step in the right direction and allows the market to value that cash as something more than zero, which is the structural problem at the moment. Now, as far as coronavirus goes and the, the impact on attitudes to, to the return of that cash on the balance sheet, we've seen some mixed responses. Uh, on the bright side, on the positive side, there are some companies who are undeterred with share buybacks and the return of that surplus cash, notwithstanding uh, the impact of coronavirus. There are some who are 
fully subscribed to the idea of returning that cash and doing buybacks, but have said that they want to take a break for a quarter or two in order just to see how things settle, settle down. And then there are the you know, head banging cases, the ones that were always going to be quite difficult and resistant to our suggestions, but now feel that they've got, a, they've got an excuse and that uh, COVID vindicates their cash for a rainy day approach and want to tell us to go away and leave them alone. So I think that, that there is a mix, but the major in the majority of cases, uh, you know, I think we will e either see a continuation or, or a short term delay uh, to their plans. Um, are you worried about liquidity when buying large positions in closed-end funds, or do you only do so when you're confident enough of an exit through return of assets? Yeah, I mean, liquidity in closed-end funds is an issue. Um, and, you know, it depends upon the situation. Um, where we're seeking a, an ultimate liquidation event, um, we, can, we can be patient about that liquidation event, and we can look to that to provide the liquidity at some point in the future. But the closed end fund structure clearly gives us advantages. Where we're seeking um, a more balanced or uh, a, a, a series of improvements that, that should lead to a narrowing of the discount. Again, it's not urgent for us uh, to have that liquidity immediately available, available to us. Um, it can be a measured progressive um, exit over time as we see those improvements implemented and we see the discounts uh, starting to narrow. And uh, really that's the beauty of the closed end fund structure. It gives us uh, the luxury of, of having time, but um, investing in, in some assets that are illiquid means that we have to have the courage of our convictions and we have to do the research that we can have uh, the confidence in our investment cases. Okay, and Pershing Square Holdings has had a great year so far on the back of its big short, yes. But it's still on a huge discount considering it only invests in listed North American companies. Are you still happy with the direction of travel there? Well, we've certainly been extremely happy with the direct uh, growth. As you say, it's been a spectacular investment. We've seen um, quite aggressive activity on the share buyback front and the discount that continues to exist uh, doesn't make sense to us and it looks remarkably attractive as you say for a portfolio of large liquid um, american companies so i think um, what we are happy with the direction of travel in the sense that they're doing the right things and we would expect the continuation of that to ultimately lead to a narrowing of the discount and the fact that they are continuing to, to buy back shares uh, at this level is accretive to us as ongoing shareholders and at some point uh, I'm pretty confident the market won't leave it at the kind of discount that it is but they are moving in the right direction. Uh, any comments on SoftBank and the rationale for owning that? Sure. Um, SoftBank uh, has been a business that we've, uh, a company that we've long been intrigued by. It's a conglomerate family controlled holding company on a massive discount. And indeed, in February of this year, it was trading at a discount between 60 and 70%. Um, and what's long appealed to, to us has been that discount, but what's deterred us has at the same time been a lack of a catalyst really for unlocking or, or narrowing that discount. And that really started to change in, in February when Elliot took a big position, publicly asked the company to sell assets and do share buybacks and to improve their corporate governance. And um, for us, that was the, the, the catalyst. The response from the company has been extremely positive. They've announced and confirmed a series of asset disposals, a series of share buybacks, a focus on the discount. And often in these cases, the market um, analysts, journalists are focused on on the wrong thing and the focus has been on the disastrous investment in WeWork and on the investment the vision fund portfolio that they've been running that's seen so many write-offs and so many disastrous investments but in aggregate those those investments make up maybe 10% of, of the total NAV 
And the real value here is in Alibaba and some of the other major listed investments that they've made. And uh, what we've seen in the last three months is the market steadily realizing that the Vision Fund is not that relevant to the, to the valuation case. More relevant has been the asset disposals that they've made from the other parts of the portfolio. And that the cash has been put to use buying back shares on a 60, 70% discount, which is massively accretive. And that really cements the view that uh, management is now focused on narrowing that discount substantially. So for us, it's been a tremendously successful uh, investment this year. We added to it at the March lows at valuations more than half where, where it is today. And it's still trading on a discount that we think is north of 50%. So there's still a long way to go, bearing in mind that the company plans to buy back a huge amount of shares uh, in the remainder of this year. And I've got a question. Do you engage with boards management of every closed in fund in which you invest? Oh, absolutely. Um, we won't invest in a closed end fund unless we think there's something that we can bring uh, to the table as a large substantial shareholder. And we will have a dialogue, an ongoing dialogue with the boards of all the investment trusts we're invested in. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's aggressive. Um, it, it's usually constructive and, as I said, private. And it can cover a whole host of, of topics ranging from board composition to discount control mechanisms uh, and the like. Okay, that's all the written questions. Does anybody want to, you can unmute yourself and you can ask questions in person if you like as well. All right, well, I'd like to thank everybody for attending our webinar. Um, as you can see on the screen right now, um, there is um, a link. Actually, we didn't put down the link, but if you go to our website, there is a page called Insights, which also gives a few more details on some of the activities and also just about different topics, such as activism and our approach to it. And um, you can have a read through there. And certainly feel free to um, send any questions or emails either to, through Quill or to us directly. And thank you very much for attending our webinar.